Pants my my ass. I'm on my floor. Bonjour, Monsieur Pussycat. Cracking toast, poet. Start uh, spreading the uh, news. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the short podcast about short films. I'm your host, and today we're discussing the Academy Award for Best Animated Short. Today's episode is yet another bonus episode, where we look back on the past decade, the 1980s, look for trends, find some interesting stories, and see how it all ties into what's coming up next in the category. And at the end, I'll rank my top 10 nominees of the 1980s and give some recommendations for non-nominated animated shorts as well. But first, I want to shout out the other half of these podcast episodes, my lovely guests who have so graciously taken time out of their finite lives to watch obscure Oscar-nominated animated shorts and talk about them for approximately an hour. So, thank you to Owen Daly, Madeline Moss, Christoph, Ronaldo Sosa, Ian Faster, Zeta Short, Chloe, Luke Gill, and April. So, so many lovely friends, so many lovely shorts. It is an honor to know you all. So, the 1980s is what I think of as the end of the quote-unquote grab bag era, where anything and everything could win the category. There was never any real favorites in the category. Just because you came from a big studio or destined to become classics doesn't mean you're going to win. Sometimes you lose to a Sunday in New York, and you just have to accept that. This is really the decade where I least understand why certain films win. Even as I develop the light comedy theory, there's nothing that explains how Crack, Tango, and A Sunday in New York can all win this award outside of the fickle nature of the human race, especially when filtered through a group like the Academy. Well, let's look back at a few things we can parse from this decade. Let's first look at Frederick Bach. He wins two awards this decade, becoming one of only two people to win multiple awards since the 1960s. The other person will win his first award in next week's episode. Uh, Bach earns his acclaim at his Oscars through not really appealing to any sensibilities of the Academy. I'm certain the Oscars were the furthest thing from his mind. No, he won simply by making great short films. Beauty unlike anything yet seen in this category keyword there being yet, wait till we get some more Alexander Petrov films. He, he weaves these epic yet grounded stories that urge you to just care a bit about, about the environment to varying degrees. Uh, truly one of my favorite names to see among the nominees in a given year because you know he will provide something quality. I even bought a DVD box set of all his films, half because I love his films, half because I got sick of the 24... 24- 240p YouTube videos and wanted something with a bit of higher quality, not to mention just making them so much easier to find. For the upcoming episode involving his final film, The Mighty River, it was so hard to find a copy with the English narration, but now I can listen to the sweet tones of Donald Sutherland whenever I please. Another notable nominee in this decade is, of course, Pixar, the Oppenheimer of the animation world, giving us the power of 3D computer animation, but not realizing the horrors it would eventually cause. It only gets two nominations and one win this decade, and it never gets the same dominance it finds in the animated feature category, but Pixar and the win for Tin Toy represent so much of the change that's going to come in this category. It makes several allusions to it. But once we get to the 2000s, this category would become overrun with CG films, especially bad CG films, and we just have to deal with that. Thankfully, though, there's never a year where every nominee is computer animated. There's always at least one traditionally animated or stop-motion film to provide some diversity in animation styles. Now, I'm going to start grouping these films. We have a lot of of really artsy and really foreign films that end up winning. And this decade literally gets bookended by The Fly and Balance, two European animated shorts with Tango and Annabella and a Greek tragedy coming in the middle, all without dialogue, which is also a popular factor. They just leave me confused as to how these films even got here. How does any film get nominated? I know that they have to be submitted and there's a whole rating process to find a nominees list, but I'm wondering how does a film like The Fly 
go from just being a film made by an animator in Hungary to an Oscar winner in America? Is this an intentional choice by the directors or producers? Does someone dream of an Oscar when they release the film to festivals? Or does it just kind of happen with a why not mentality? Why not make a film? Why not screen it? Why not get international acclaim? Why not submit it for an Oscar? Why not win? I'd imagine both are kind of true, as well as a secret third thing I haven't even thought of yet, but these are all so much higher quality than our last category. We have The American Rejects, Sunday in New York and Charade. Okay, despite that naming, I don't actually hate these shorts much at all. I've developed a sort of fondness for Sunday, especially. But these are films that are just so light in content and so shallow and really kind of lacking in humor as well. Make you just wonder, why would anyone vote for this, especially when you compare it to other nominees? But whatever the reason, the fact is a statistically significant amount of people voted for these shorts over the other ones. And that's the way it is. Moving on from winners, we're starting to see some pop-ups from one of my favorite types of nominees to get in this category. The total nobody. People who are not notable making films that are not notable, yet somehow getting one of the most notable things in the film industry, an Oscar nomination. These are people without Wikipedia pages who don't really have a career beyond their nomination, we have seen people resembling this before, but they usually still are some major animators in their home country who run their own animation studio. But at Sound of Sunshine, Sound of Rain is what I consider to be the first true nobody nominee. The actual person nominated is some TV producer. The person who made it goes on to be a VFX artist and supervisor, and the actual film is one of the least watched nominees in one of the least watched categories of the Oscars. And yet, it's fantastic. One of my favorite nominees of all time. This is usually this is the best part of these nobody nominees. It's not like bigger categories where unknown usually means it's actually dog shit. Unknown means that they just weren't lucky enough to get wider publicity. It will get more nominees like this in the future as the ability to make films independently gets easier and easier, despite the category going back to be more and more studio driven and corporate, and eventually providing a fun dichotomy nominees are either really famous or their names that haven't been uttered since the, nom since the nominees were read on Oscar night. These almost never win. Perhaps winning would disqualify them from being a nobody, but they're the gems hiding in plain sight. I'm kind of disappointed I didn't have any fun or interesting stories to share this time about our nominees, but that's just how it be sometimes, especially since the 80s doesn't really have a common theme to, to unite around like other decades. When your biggest winner is just a random guy in Quebec who loves nature, you're kind of fucked. And I already say enough about him in his four episodes, trying to go through his autobiography, which I actually discovered was incomplete. He never got around to writing about his post-film career. I'm sorry to hear that, Frederick Beck. I would have loved to read about your time working with Greenpeace or doing more environmental work. So let's just get to my top 10 nominees instead. Number 10 is Tin Toy, the first Pixar short to effectively bring characters to life and tell a complete emotional arc. And it's funny and it's adorable. A, a perfect example of what Pixar would go on to excel at and become known for. Number 9 is The Man Who Planted Trees, the first but not last Frederick Back film in this ranking. Like I said, it's utterly gorgeous, and the story is sublime. The thing that puts this below his other films is just the fact that it's twice as long as them. Which, yes, is needed, but also is slow enough to where it becomes a sort of a slog at times. Again, still absolutely love it, just not as much as number 8, Crack. Now that's what I'm talking about. A banger music video about a fucking chair. Hell fucking yeah. Brings forth some emotions that are too complex to be named, but I am living for it. Number seven is The Cat Came Back. Endlessly catchy, will stick with me till the day I die, and just so, so fun with fantastic slapstick comedy to boot. Number six is The Snowman, a Christmas classic for all the right reasons. Gorgeous animation, endless charm, heartfelt story, with a gut punch of emotion right at the end. Plus that song, oh my god. 
Uh, number five is The Creation. Joan C. Gratz is a director known for her clay painting, a technique she personally developed, and The Creation is all but a proof of concept. Gorgeous imagery telling the story of creation, and James Earl Jones just turns it all the way up to 11, making this an epic short that impacts me deeply. Number four is All Nothing. Yes, Frederick Beck's three nominations are all in this top ten. I told you I love him and his films. Uh, this film also tells the story of creation, albeit with much darker implications beyond it, going into the greed of humanity as we slaughter animals. It's violent, but it's fantastic, and it's always exquisitely animated. Number three is Your Face film that has wormed its way into into my subconscious not just through its dreamy music that i ended up listening to so many times on spotify but through its surreal imagery the way this man's face morphs so much in so many unique ways it's hypnotic and amazing and unforgettable also i want to shout out bill Plimpton's couch gag from the simpsons where he essentially remakes the short with homer simpson uh it's equally amazing Number two, Sound of Sunshine, Sound of Rain, a fantastic and emotional but not exploitative story about a blind black boy. The imagery is exquisite, inspired by the pictures by Kenneth Longtemps in the original book by Florence Perry Heidi, which I forgot to mention in the original episode, and I'm deeply sorry about that. But this short is not just an exploration of discrimination, but a depiction of humanity in its purest sense. Absolutely beautiful. And number one is balance, an empty void, a floating platform, tall, pallid figures, a box. That's all you need to achieve a fantastic short film. So simple in concept, yet the film explores its concept to its furthest extent. And from that, you can ex extrapolate so many ideas. Or you can just enjoy the imagery and the aesthetic of it. It's a fantastic example of what short films can be and deserves to be studied. That's my top 10. As for non-nominated films, I'm going to save my favorite film for last, but I will start off with some more familiar names. We have prior nominee Faith Hubley, whom after John's death still kept making animated shorts. My favorite of her solo work is the film Enter Life, about the development of life on Earth. Another prior nominee, Renee jo Jodoin, made Rectangles and Rectangles and Rectangles. A seizure-inducing short film about rectangles. It's fantastic. Not prior nominees, but certainly familiar name. We have the Charlie Brown short film, Bring Me the Head of Charlie Brown. Uh, gather the family around and watch this short over the holidays. It's, it's hilarious. Uh, also, we have an early example of Lego stop motion short films, also called Breck Films, with the Magic Portal. And now we start getting to more experimental territory. Uh, there is the Quay Brothers and their quintessential masterpiece, Street of Crocodiles, Jan Sankmeyer's Darkness, Light, Darkness, Vince Collins' Life is Flashing Before Your Eyes, Tay Wei's Feelings of Mountains and Waters, and Self-Portrait by Kiyachiro Kawamoto. I said I'd save for the best for last, and that, for me, is the series of Soviet short films surrounding the character of Kuzka. There's four films, the first being A House for Kuzka, followed by Adventures of Brownie, Tale, of for, Tale for Natasha, and Return of Brownie. Now you might ask what these films are about. I do not know for certain. I watched all four of these films in one night six years ago with a group of friends and no subtitles. We tried our best to follow along and had a blast. Maybe these films hold up, I'm not sure, but I do love that little gremlin known as Kuzka, and I think you will too. And that's the end of the bonus episode. Once again, I'd like to thank the guests from this past decade. I'm so excited for what the next decade has in store. Thank you, listener, for tuning in. This has been the short podcast about short films. Until next time, goodbye.